So I first wanted to say that um, when I first heard about this meeting and was invited to come, I was very honored and I thank the, the people who are organizing it. And I, I thought about um, why it was significant for me to come because the work that Jay had done played such a role, a, a significant role in shaping my early career. And I thought this was the title I gave, but then upon reflection, I thought I could have given it this title, which is how I launched an academic career by failing to explain J Jay Feinberg's experiments. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so let me explain why this is the case and why his experiments are so good that even if you fail to explain them, it can launch your academic career. Um, so I started grad school in Santa Barbara with Jim Langer in 1992. And uh, that was around the time that these crack branching experiments uh, first sort of hit the press. And, um, and Jim was very excited about them. I mean, he had been working in theory of fracture for a while at that time. And I had come to him as a like, second year grad student. And I said, I'd like to work with you. And he said, well, I don't think you could really have a career as a theoretical physicist working in fracture. And I said, well, I'd like to do computer <coughs> simulations of these things. And he said, well, maybe if you did computer simulations, that could happen. So, uh, so we agreed that we would try to simulate some of these systems. And, and then uh, Iran's work came out. And you know, so we were very excited about doing different kinds of atomistic simulations of these systems and trying to understand the crack branching phenomenon. Um, and so this was the work, the, the simulation work that was sort of current at the time that we were thinking about, which was the work with Farid Abra of Fareed Abraham. And I had gone up to do a joint study with him. And they had taken a sort of two-dimensional lattice, triangular lattice, and put a crack in it. And they saw that they could propagate a, this crack and that they did have different amounts of wiggliness, though no crack branching. And you see, in addition, there was this uh, spitting out of dislocations from the crack tip. So there were a lot of interesting physics going on. But we thought, in a burst of very misguided naivete, um, well, we don't want to do this in, in a crystal because he gets all these dislocations. That's just complicating everything. Wouldn't it all be much simpler if we did this in an amorphous material? Because after all, the experiments were done in PMMA, which is not really crystalline to begin with. So let's do molecular dynamic simulations in amorphous stuff. So I started doing simulations in amorphous stuff, and these were some of those simulations. Uh, so these were like polydispersed Leonard Jones 2D uh, molecular dynamic simulations. And um, you know we played around with different things. These, these were two different kinds of simulations that involved uh, different potentials, different interatomic potentials. And we saw we could get very brittle behavior. We could get very ductile behavior with different behavior of sort of voids around the crack tip. But clearly, this was not simpler than the crystalline case. And um, the more we looked at it, the more interesting it became. So these are the same simulations, just not um, focusing right at the crack tip. And the blue regions here are showing where you have some kind of plastic deformation. And we became very interested in these sort of clouds of plastic deformation that were forming or you know, to, to a larger extent or lesser extent near the crack tip and how that was controlling the ductileness or brittleness of the crack. So this is sort of how I ended up getting interested in the whole STZ problem was by trying to work on J. Feinberg's experiments. So. Um, and then I went on to do a postdoc uh, with Jim Rice at Harvard and interacted a lot with Alan Needleman and uh, was trying to use finite element <coughs> methods to understand the crack branching, which essentially the outcome of that work was showing that there was really something I, not very satisfying about the finite element methods. And uh, so that work got published. I learned at, at Alan's uh, birthday conference that this was like one of only three or four papers that Alan and Jim were both on. And yet I managed to bury it in perhaps the most obscure journal possible. So, uh, but I can't say that we really understood uh, Jay's experiments at that point. But we did get to work on the shear transformation zones, which ended up being very interesting on, of itself. So I'll try to show you some shear transformation zones. Maybe this will help answer some of the questions that came up during Alan's talk. So these are close-ups, really tight close-ups of regions of the same kind of stuff we were looking at before. And these are in bodies that are being subjected to shear on a much larger scale. And what you see is that the amorphous material, unlike the crystalline material, doesn't, can't really propagate a long-range dislocation <laughs> defect to relieve the stress. But instead, what you see is 
rearrangements of local atoms. So if you look at this cage of large atoms, you see this body is being compressed along this direction and extended along this direction. And it's able to sort of collapse in that way locally um, and relieve a little bit of, st of stress. Um, and then those occur throughout the material. So that's what you were seeing as the blue in the previous uh, images. And so these had been thought, theorized about and thought about since the late 70s by Franz Papen and Ali Argon, where they had talked about flow defects or shear transformation events in glassy materials. And so we wanted to uh, understand how you would make a theory of those kinds of things and build it into a theory of plasticity. Um, so the basic cartoon of the theory of plasticity that I worked on at the time was that you think about the material as riddled with these, um, these point defects that uh, Alan was talking about. They can basically have some orientation. Here I've just shown two distinct orientations, but really they could be oriented anyway. And that if you load the material up, the bulk material up inside the microstructure, uh, some of these are flipping to align with the microstructure and in the process some are getting destroyed and others are, regions are getting created and they can sort of lead to prop uh, continuous plastic flow. So that, that's a bit of a, that was basically the picture. But I think the unresolved issue at that point was that we could see these shear transformation zones only a posteriori. That is, I could look at the atoms in the original structure, I could deform the structure and look at how the atoms shifted, and in that way I could tell where you had a deformation event. But of course, if you want to understand the microstructure of the material, what you want to ask yourself is, can I look at the initial structure and say, oh, you have 27 SDZs in this structure, and this is how they're oriented. Um, and that we couldn't do. That was not possible. So it sort of leaves open the question, how can you do statistical mechanics on anything if you can't really count the defects or characterize them in any way? Um, so there's been a lot of work on that since that time, and I'll just try to quickly summarize some, some of, but not all of it. So this was work by Lisa Manning and Andrea Liu looking at what they called soft spots. Uh, at this point, they were identifying soft spots by looking at soft vibrational modes in the uh, Hessian matrix of the um, molecular system, and so they could find these soft vibrational modes, and then they would pull out the lowest frequency soft vibrational modes and identify, by looking at the eigenvectors, the atoms that participated disproportionately in the soft modes. And so here they're picking out the atoms in this 2D system that participate disproportionately in the soft vibrational modes, and then they look at where it deforms, and these red arrows are where a particular deformation event happened, and it correlates fairly well with the atoms that participate disproportionately in the soft modes. Um, and so that was good. That was certainly a, a move in the right direction. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry. It's the problem with putting animations in your slides. Um, and so we've looked at, um, tried to correlate these sort of soft modes, which are illustrated here by the color maps, with uh, local structural features, like can you correlate this with how the atoms are arranged around given atoms. So here we're looking at short range order. Um, and you find that all of these things correlate with the deformation. The local structure correlates with the deformation. The soft modes correlate with the deformation. But they're not, um, they don't provide a mechanism for doing what I had set out to do from the beginning, which is can you count where are these defects um, and sort of tell the difference between a quick, you know, different glasses of different origin. So, so we've continued to work on this. So what I wanted to share with you today was some recent work by Sylvain Patinet, who's at uh, ESPCI, uh, who was a former postdoc of mine. And we've been working together to try to characterize something we call the local yield stress field. So in a way, this is sort of the simplest, stupidest thing you can imagine doing. It was originally proposed by Peter Sulich. So the idea is, if we can take a little frame, a little mechanical frame, and position it at any point in our glassy material, then we could imagine taking that frame and slowly deforming the system along any direction of shear. So I could stretch along this direction, compress along that direction, slowly, slowly do this until I get my first instability. And in that way, characterize how much stress I have to put on the yield stress to get the first instability. And I could do that in many different directions. And of course, there's an issue of choosing the right length scale. So we 
And then, um, but you can do that then at any point in the material. In, a, in essence, you're characterizing something that's a, a scalar field you're because. The yeah, so the yellow atoms are constrained to deform as I, in some affine way. And then the atoms inside the ring are allowed to relax as they'd, as they'd prefer. Um, so what Sylvain gets out by doing that is a map that looks like this. So here the color scale is the yield stress, how much stress I have to impose to get the first plastic event. And here I've taken the minimum, he's taken the minimum over all the imposed orientations. And so you see there are these sort of lemon yellow spots that have very low uh, yield stress to activate. You have uh, these darker regions that have very high yield stress to activate. And you see there's a very definite set of spots that are picked out, of course, related to the length scale of the probe. And then what we can do is take the whole body and shear it from the boundary. And then the teal circles you see um, uh, superimposed <laughs> upon the color map are where we see the first deformation event when you shear in different orientations. So they correlate fairly well with where you see the yellow spots. So this does seem to be a local property of the material where you can deform. And um, it seems to be well predicted by the yield stress. Uh, you don't need to know global information to predict where they are. The other, other interesting thing that this data allows you to do is get at one of the underlying questions, which is what characterizes these local defects? Um, and I think the literature has been a little confused in that people like to describe these local defects as aris arising due to local high free volume, which is a bit like low density. But that would be a scalar order parameter. So you'd think if what really counts at the end of the day is just local high free volume, then if you have local high free volume, you should be able to deform as well in one direction as another. Um, but we had hypothesized from the beginning that these things have some orientational order associated with them. So what this movie is doing is taking that sweep through the initial structure and just showing the data for given orientations of probing of that scalar field. And what you see is that, um, and the square here denotes the orientation of the probe that's being applied around each atom. And you see that the spots that are, have very low local yield stress in a particular direction don't have local yield stress in another direction. So they're clearly orientational defects. Okay. Um, in addition, we can use this to compare systems that were prepared differently. So here you see a qu system that was quenched quickly, or a uh, system that was quenched more slowly. So the system that was quenched slowly, you expect to have a more um, stable structure. And you see fewer um, and higher yield stress defects in the slowly quenched system as you would expect. And then furthermore, here we've numbered the, defer the events that happen as you continuously deform. And here we're just comparing with the structure at time zero, and you see one, two, three, four, five, even out to the tenth deformation, they seem to correlate highly with where you have low local yield stress in the initial structure. And we can quantify that. So this is comparing the low local yield stress measure to other measures that have been proposed. Red is the soft spot analysis. Uh, green is low local shear modulus. Uh, yellow is short range order. Purple is potential energy per atom. And then this last one is density. Um, the blue line is what you would expect from just a random white noise field. So all of these have some correlation with where you get deformation, but the yield stress field seems to do uh, better than the ones that have been identified previously. And uh, it still predicts the deformation after you've had 75 or so uh, events in this particular system. So they seem to be fairly persistent. So that's, that's the yield stress field picture. And so I'm going to segue to talking about something different now. Um, so one question in this field that's sort of persisted for a long time, uh, you could state in the following way. Is there some scalar quantity that somehow governs this defect field? Right? Is there something like a free volume or an effective temperature or something you could measure about the system that would tell you how many STZs there are in this particular material under this particular condition. Um, and so we've been working on this effective temperature idea. And what we've been trying to do is see, can we 
test that? Can we test that hypothesis? So let me talk a little bit about what goes into that hypothesis and then how we try um, to test it. So the idea of the effective temperature is that if you look at your glass, it's clearly a system that's fallen out of equilibrium, but not all of it has fallen out of equilibrium. So you have some fast vibrational modes, right, that are still in equilibrium with the surrounding environment. And then you have the configurations in the glass, the, the bond structure, that has essentially fallen out of equilibrium. And of course we know for the vibrational modes, we could define an energy for, the, uh, for those modes, we can define an entropy for those modes, and we can define thereby a temperature that applies to the vibrational subsystem. So, but if we could imagine that we could separate out the configurational degrees of freedom from the vibrational degrees of freedom, or the slow from the fast, then perhaps also for the slow configurational subsystem, you could imagine asking the question, how many different ways are there I could configure these bonds to produce a bond structure with this energy? And if you could imagine doing that, then you could say, okay, I could at least in principle talk about an entropy for this configurational subsystem, and if I could, if it has an energy, then there is a derivative which would have at least the scale, would look like a temperature, would it act like a temperature? Would it be useful for describing this structure? Okay. So how do we get at that temperature? Um, so what we've been doing is applying a very simple ansatz, partially just to make our lives easy. So we know that if we think about the regular temperature, um, you know, we would usually go about measuring it in the usual way by bringing it into equilibrium with something else and look at the property of the something else, like thermal expansion of the liquid in a thermometer. But if another way one could potentially do that, if you could measure the energy you put into the system and you knew the specific heat, you could anticipate the change in temperature just by knowing the energy input and the specific heat. So perhaps for the effective temperature, if we propose that there's some specific heat-like quantity and it's fairly constant for our purposes, that if we could measure the change in the energy in the bond structure, we could figure out uh, relative differences in this effective temperature. Um, and we can easily measure this in molecular dynamic simulations because extracting the bond energy from a molecular dynamic simulation is trivial. Um, so then uh, what we do is we say, okay, if we can get out that effective temperature, then we can imagine a dimensionless quantity, which is just that Kb times that effective temperature divided by the energy to create a defect, to create an STZ. That's what I'm going to call chi. I can then relate that to the energy per atom measured in MD. And then, sorry, this is not a very good color for the circumstances. But, um, and then I could say, well, I can think about the density of STZs as being related through an Arrhenius relationship to chi, right? Because this is just e to the minus energy to create a zone over KBT effective. So this is just saying the density of the zones is related to that effective temperature. So that's all um, hypothesis. So then we want to propose a constitutive equation, something that would describe how the material deforms as we're shearing it. And I'm just going to show the plastic part. Clearly, there's also elasticity in these systems, and that's included, but I'm not going to go into that. So we have to describe a plastic strain rate. We're going to say the plastic strain rate is proportional to how many STZs we have, which, as I said before, is we're just going to write e to the minus 1 over chi. And then we have a, some rate at which those do their STZ dance, so a rate at which those flip or transform, like Alan puts into his model. And so our typical rates look they essentially go to zero below a yield stress, and then they rise monotonically. You can argue a lot over what these, is, what these are. We just put in a simple heuristic for this. Um, but then the tricky part is this chi, which is this effective temperature, it's not in equilibrium with the outside temperature. So we have to describe how it evolves with time. So we need a master equation for chi. So we say, okay, chi in increases with the plastic work you put into the system. So as you do plastic work on the system, some of it goes to disorder the structure. And the fraction that goes to disorder the structure decreases as you disorder the system up to some ultimate chi infinity, which is sort of the most you could disorder the structure by shear. And that we're going to say it actually uh, diffuses like a temperature would, but with a, with a mobility that depends on the local plastic strain rate. So this is our constitutive equation that we'd like to test. Okay. 
So I'm going to very quickly, with my five minutes, um, so what we do is we do what we're used to doing. We do molecular dynamic simulation where we start with some atomistic initial condition, we shear it, we look at the stress strain rep response and the microstructural evolution. But now what we could do is take those potential energy per atom values and derive an initial chi field. So how is the effective temperature fluctuating spatially in my system? Then we could apply the the constitutive law I just showed you, thanks to Chris Rycroft and his wonderful code, and we can get out the same thing, stress strain response and how the micro microstructure evolves, and then we can cross compare these two things, and that th thereby somehow test the constitutive equation against, um, against the MD. And so what that ends up looking like is like this. So here we're looking at the potential energy per atom histogram for atoms that are, have more strain than average and less, Initially, they're the same, and then eventually you'll see a shear band will evolve in the system. So here the yellow are the atoms that have more shear than usual, blue is less than average, and then at around 10% strain, they'll bifurcate and form a shear band. This will be the strain per atom, this is the potential energy per atom, and this is what the constitutive theory predicts. And so to do this, we've had to think a lot about how do you coarse grain? And I'm just going to say that we've thought a bunch about looking at coarse graining at different length scales in order to make this comparison. And we find that if you have a coarse graining length scale above 32 to 50 angstroms, it seems to converge. And the stress strain, this is just an example of the stress strain curves, which I won't go into in detail. And these are side by side comparisons of what we, these are the MD derived results at different, as we increase the strain. This is what the continuum theory predicts. And you see that for low coarse graining length scale, we get garbage. But if the coarse graining length scale is high enough, we get pretty good correspondence. So I will leave it there. Oh, I just wanted to leave, to bring it back to fracture, I just wanted to quickly show you some of Iran's simulations applying this constitutive theory also in the context of fracture, which actually perhaps fortuitously, but certainly evocatively shows behavior that Quite matches quite well the um, metallic glass typical experimental results. So I'll just leave it there. I won't read through the summary, but thanks for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. So you have been extracting the temperatures just by assuming the specific heat was a constant. Yeah. So the next step, which we've already been discussing, is mm -hmm. how it might one get Right, right, right. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the one thing we've been discussing has been can you get the specific heat from the fluctuations in the energy because statistical mechanics would say that that's possible. And so these graphs show that, you know, if you take different size scales systems, so here you're going from 5 to 50 angstroms, you can see the systematic decrease in the width of the potential energy fluctuation. So perhaps from that we can get a more quantitative handle on the temperature. Right. That was just uh, this. Oops, no, sir. This? They're not conserved, no. Right. So, yeah, so, I mean, that's sort of uh, the basis of that is actually work that Iran did with Jim Langer which is to show that if you have a system and you apply the second law of thermodynamics and you have some dynamics where you have this sort of creation annihilation behavior, that those populations will on some time scale come into equilibrium with this effective temperature. Um, so that's where this sort of, this Arrhenius sort of relationship comes out of. that energy, potential energy, is maybe not the best characteristic of the material structure. Have you thought about maybe reformulating the, the framework uh, to be written in terms of some other structural variables that are maybe more sensitive and more, uh, more predictive right. of plastic deformation? So, I mean, I think particularly, like, you see, 
up here. I mean, I think there are different scales of description you can imagine for, oops, sorry, uh, for, uh, you know, the amorphous material. And, you know, clearly here we're using potential energy per atom, which is the purple curve. Right, which doesn't actually correlate that well. If you wanted to look for STZs, using potential energy per atom is a terrible idea. Right. right? In, your, in, your, in your coarse grain uh, picture and comparison. Right. We use, right. But it does have correlations above what you'd expect for white noise. So there is some information to be extracted there. But what we'd like to do is if we could go in with something like the yield stress field and actually pull out something that's a statistical description, like how many STZs are here, what are their thresholds, and then relate that to the potential energy per atom, maybe that would be a more satisfying picture because you're actually directly relating the populations of the STZs to the behavior. Right, but then in, in terms of the theoretical framework, you would need to have maybe an adaptation to, the, to these newly defined fields. Right, so I mean there are a lot of open questions like how do we expect the populations of STZs to change as the system is disordered either through shear or through um, you know, different uh, quench protocols. I mean those are all open questions. So, so far we've only imposed pure shear. We haven't included dilation and uh, expansion, although you can, the data is in there, we just haven't pulled it out. You could look to see as you apply the pure shear, is there, there should probably be a spike in the, or a maximum in the uh, pressure in the local region as a function of the strain. And from that you could get out something like an activation volume associated with the defects. So that may be interesting. Right, so the activation volume might tell you that, you know, putting it under hydrostatic compression d inhibits the transformation or, you know, vice versa. Yeah, sure. uh, maybe you said that, but do you try different size rings? Yeah, so we did a systematic um, analysis of the different size probes. And what we find is that, um, as you would expect naively, as you go to larger probes, you actually lose fidelity because you're, de you're decreasing in uh, resolution. So where you previously could discern two STZs, now you just get the most, the easiest to trigger one. And then if you try to go smaller, you start losing resolution because the system is over constrained. So five angstrom or five atom diameters ended up being a kind of maximum in the resolution. But you can also say that it's, it's a local effect. Uh, yeah, it's good. I mean, because essentially you can pick out, I mean, if it were really global, if the dominant feature was the, uh, let's say, the way that stress is transmitted from the boundary, yeah. you know, through the, the disordered medium, then you would think, well, doing a local probe isn't really going to tell you enough information to predict anything. So but clearly there that? are other sources of, of, of disorder in the system. So how does this kind of match up with what they were doing, with what, what Andrea is doing with machine learning? Because she also has ah. very local criteria there. Yeah, I think, yeah, so I actually, well, I have a slide, but I'd have to pick it out. Yeah, so what they do is they take a family of different, like, two-body and three-body structural parameters local, and then they try to use machine learning to find the best set of local parameters for any given system. So it's much less expensive once you've done the machine learning fitting to do this, the characterization of the material than it is to do the yield stress. But what it doesn't get you is it doesn't get you the distribution of barrier heights that are so critical for a lot of these mesoscale models like the one that Alan was showing, right? You get out uh, uh, softness, but you don't really know what that means in terms of the yield stress. Yeah. Sometimes they're the best. <laughs> well, I feel guilty, you know, your whole career. <laughs> You don't right. have 100% correlation here. I can see in the, in the pictures as you have screening effects. Mm -hmm. So this would be a way of 
uh, actually maybe connecting with measurements. Yeah. yeah. You change your fraction of this because you change density. Change the, and yeah, the compliance you locally. You can define from mm -hmm. this phase. And from the phase, you can produce back yeah. the structure and see what the structure is. Well, yeah, I mean, I'd be happy to talk about it more. I, th I think, yeah, any th way we could get at these things through experimental measures, I think, would be well, we very we valuable. Yeah, we can put a sound wave through. Yeah, yeah. See how much, see where the, what the dissipation looks like and correlated with STDs. Right. Yeah, so we'd have to see. I mean, it's not always clear because you have some amount of anelastic response, like very, very low barrier events that you could get just by a gentle sound wave moving through that would lead to dissipation. But those may, are most likely the ones that even a, a small amount of temperature are, es are essentially explored thermodynamically on short time scales. So it's, it's not clear the same inelastic events you get, you harvest by one mechanism are the ones that are operative through another mechanism. So I think a big, a big kick might, might do better, I'm not yeah. Sure about what uh, Jay is proposing, because we have both the bi and plastic modes. Mm -hmm. Some sound wave would be mostly sensitive to the Dubai modes. Mm -hmm. so it, no? it depends on wavelengths. Well, the same energies, very similar energies. No, uh -huh. if, if you use the very high like, uh, sound, very high frequency, you can s scan also this. With high frequency, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, let's continue the discussion in the break. Thanks okay. very much. Thank you. <laughs>